2003. This is the beginning of an interview with Mr. Ernest Wills. Mr. Wills is a veteran of World War II, having served in the Pacific in the U.S. Marines. Uh, this interview is being conducted at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Frederick Wallace. I am the interviewer. Ms. Wills, as I explained before, this will be your story. This is your opportunity to tell uh, for the benefit of your children, your grandchildren, what life was like with you in the military. Mm -hmm. So will you begin, please, by telling us where you were born, from what town you enlisted in the service, and why you entered the service? And from there, just take us on through your military career. All will right. you begin, please? Well, I was born in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and uh, it's a, a small city up near Scranton, in northeastern Pennsylvania. It was a very industrial boom town, but has now gone by the rest of them, down to a rust town. So we were told then, like World War, we knew War, we knew World War II was coming. So I studied with the school, high school then. So I thought I'd take up German because I thought we'd be fighting the Germans because my father came from Germany. So when I went to, to sign up down there, they asked me one time if I had any compunctions about fighting against the Germans. I said, not at all. I said, I'm fighting for the United States. I'm an American citizen, because I heard stories my father told me about Bismarck and Germany. Well, then my brother, we knew the war did start, and my brother, he, he immediately signed up for the Marine Corps, so I wanted to go with him. But I was married at the time. so. I, we both signed up, and he went in right away because I got a deferment till my wife had her child. So they let me go from November of the preceding year to the March of the next year. Then they signed me. Uh, they signed me to Paris Island, South Carolina. So I went down there, went to boot camp for 13 weeks. And the way you think that's fun? That is not fun. Well, I'll tell you, I never felt so good in my whole life because I did exercise. I didn't goof around. Then after that, we get our training. We were fit. We sent to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, where we learned more combat. And up there, we met different people, and you learn a lot in a service like that. We were getting ready to ship out, and we didn't know where we were going. But I seen them loading parkas and sled dogs and stuff. I said, "Geez, we're going to we're going to go to Alaska someplace." So we wound up in San Diego, California, and from San Diego. We went right from there right to Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal is beautiful out there, and uh, I met a Catholic priest out there, and I saw about the natives out there, they dressed in their natural form, and I asked them what the life expectancy was out there of people, 35 years. Disease takes them like, fat, like crazy. And I asked them what, what kind of problem they had. They had a terrible problem when the Japs occupied Guadalcanal. So all we, were, we were just taking out the remnants that were hit up the hills, they would not give up. But the, the, we called them gooks, which was wrong. But they said <laughs> that they used to catch the Japanese that night, go for water, they'd cut their throats and they'd start killing them. But then they start, they raped all the young girls on an island and they had them over to another island. Went on and on like that. And the, we, we took the island off the Japanese. I wasn't there, but the, our boys did. And the Japs kept sending troops over, and they kept, our boys were sinking their ships as fast as they got there. They call it Iron Bottom Bay. So many Japanese things there. And we, as we were at Henderson Field there. That's where we met the, the fly, our flying circus group, group over there. There, there are a bunch I'm of. I'm sorry, that's where you met what? The, the, our our pilots. Oh, okay. The, the, I forget what the hell they. I can't even think of their name right now. There are a bunch of there. A bunch of young guys are tough as hell, but they they are the best pilots in the world. Mm. And uh, they were real goofballs. But after that, we used to sit there and watch these ships go by, and we trained like mad, and we, we figured out we didn't know where we were going to go at all. So the officers told us we're going to Okinawa. So I said, Okinawa, where in the heck is Okinawa? So I finally got a piece that was censored back home to my wife and told her we're going to Okinawa. She told her neighbor that we were going to Okinawa. She says, "Thank God he's still in the United States." She said that meant Oklahoma. <laughs> well, it was April, and, and uh, so we trained, and we we had a beer party on an island called Mog Mog, solid beer party we had for us. And that night, or the day afterwards, the ships were like 
blinking our lights all day long trying to find where, 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 where we got all together again. And we know where Okinawa was, and this was about Good Friday. We found out where it was, and uh, April 1st was Easter Sunday. And we landed on Okinawa. And what goes through your mind is we saw D-Day pictures from World War II from France. We figured it was going to be the same thing for us. Only was the Japs played a little different. Instead of meeting us at the beach, they let us get ashore. They were in the mountains and they were dug in like crazy because they had the whole island was honeycombed with caves. They come out at night with big guns, fire them guns at you like that, and close up with steel doors. And they're all over the place. It was awful out there. Then this one day there, I thought, you know, I'm gung ho. I have a, I have a VAR and this jet plane come right over his throat, so I turn around and I did the whole, when I do a mistake, he turned around, he wheeled around, he came back. So I Can told, you uh, tell us what a BAR is? It's a Browning Automatic Rifle, but mm -hmm. it's a very heavy machine gun, like, with a tripod and a bipod or whatever you want to carry it. Then after that, uh, we would start up, go up these mountains, up to the Montoba Peninsula. We, we, the Marines were assigned to the northern half of Okinawa, and the our Army had the south, the southern half. Well, we cleaned our half out in a hurry, and the Army was stuck down in the south at Shuri Castle, and th th that was a terrible place down there. So they took them offline and put the Marines online. And uh, we were down there, we, well, we, we, we took a shellac and took because they were they really dug in. But I'll tell you one thing, the Japs might be a little wacky, but they were tough. They, well, they had a different outlook on life than we did. American people don't understand the different different lifestyles of people. Like over there to die is to be wonderful because they all had bandanas on with red red bandana flag on her signed by their relatives and they're all they're all prepared to die, which they did. Then the, what uh, what was your specialty? We were reconnaissance. We are our outfit. We have thirty nine guys, and we we're out in front, to find out where, why, and what is out there, and we relay it back. Then we get out there, and we we're told we we're cut off. They said, "Fight your way back." Yeah. You so you would go ahead of the head of the from front troops of the troops. Okay. It's all reconnaissance. You're trying to find out just what they've got, mm -hmm. and we had a tough bunch of officers because these. What we thought they were called China Marines, and anyway, a surgeon in China is a real Marine. And they were, they were really tough. So we did all the reconnaissance work like that, and we found out how brutal the Japanese were. Some of our guys were captured. They'd got, they, they tortured them, cut their bodies open, put, put rocks in their stomach and throw them back in camp. So that, that made us hate them a little more. Then we saw pictures of what everyone saw, show them they were raping the nuns out there, and they, they were brutal. They were really brutal. And you experienced this on Guadalcanal, mm -hmm. uh, rather on Okinawa. On Okinawa. On Okinawa. Mm -hmm. Then the funny part of Okinawa, there we had this Sugarloaf Hill. We were up there, and that was that was murder. That was, that was they were really entrenched there, and it was with this one night we were attacked the hill. And it was lightning and thunder like crazy. And they were dropping bombs on us by the thousands, and we didn't know what to duck, what to do, because it was lightning and thunder and the bombs. We didn't know what to do. And I know this friend of me, we were, you have a foxhole, a foxhole buddy, and we were laying there, covered up to our, with our poncho, trying to keep driving. So we felt so sticky. We found out why the next morning, the guy, the two guys were killed above us, and all the blood ran down was all over us. Oh my mm -hmm. So after that, it was, we took it all over. What, what really got me in Okinawa was oh, when we started to put down the other end of the island. There's all steep cliffs into the water. And these Japanese families, mothers, children, all holding their hands, jumping off the cliffs into the water. <laughs> Boy, it takes the heart out of you. We saw the Kichigoi, no, no harm, and they kept hand in hand and jumping off the damn cliff. Why do you think they were doing that? Because they were given a folders, there t folders that the American soldiers would rape every woman and kill every man mm. and kill children. So they were afraid of you? Because they did the same thing in, uh, in China. It showed in China, uh, the wake of Nanking, how they were taking these Chinese babies and throwing them in the air and catching them on their bayonets. Mm -hmm. So we they figured the same thing for them. But another thing, we used to throw satchel charges down into the caves. And you could hear the screaming down there because the soldiers wanted nobody come out. 
Then you see little kids come out screaming and shaking like that, just take your heart out. So these were the Japanese who lived on the island of Okinawa? They were the Japanese, they were, the, they were a Japanese army. It belonged to Japan. Mm -hmm. They were Okinawans, but I guess I don't know what the whole story is out there. But it, it's it's a small island, but we, by taking it, that was the end of the, that was really the end of the war because we were only 300 miles from Japan then. And we were supposed to go, we were supposed to land at Honshu. We were going to be carried in by our B-29s were being taken apart. We were going to fly us in. We thought we didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. But uh, after that was all over, I mean, we had some funny experiences on, on uh, it, it, w w war is something, unless you see it, you can't explain it. That's true. Because your, your mind and your body is not acclimated for that kind of stuff. What were living conditions like for you and your buddies? Well, we couldn't take a bath, we couldn't ever get a water. We had to try to be clean shaven in case you get wounded, you kind of had to clean shaven if you could. And you use your helmet for a, a pot for cooking, <laughs> for bathing, for everything else. Were you on a base or did you just set up tents know. wherever you were? Wherever we were. Mm -hmm. The reconnaissance company, you're strictly on your own because uh, the, the, rest, the, other, the rest of the boys are all back there and they have to wait until we tell them what is up there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the group I was with, they're all, all a bunch of college boys. They're no, no, not dumb at all. They know what was going on. Mm -hmm. They're from Mississippi, state of Georgia, Alabama, Texas, Pennsylvania, all over. I enjoyed the Marine Corps though because I figured if I'm going to get killed, at least I know why or how. How long were you on Okinawa? Three months. They usually don't keep you in combat that long. They may or went when you get arrested, but we, we had to finish it then. But the oddest thing I saw was when we got a, on April 12th, 1945, they told us that Franklin D. Roosevelt had died. I never seen men cry. Mm -hmm. because. In my estimation, he's the greatest man we ever had in here. Hmm. I think a lot of people would agree with you. Because I grew up, grew up during the Depression, and boy, that was something else. That was the other thing. The Depression stiffened us because Hitler thought we were a bunch of panty waste, but that Depression made us tough because mm -hmm. he had to fight for everything. But we, we knew the war was coming. Mm -hmm. Then after, after that, they sent us back to. Um, Okay, I sent us back to Guam for R&R, &R. and where they, where they laid us out down there was right, right below North Field where they had 500 B-29 bombers which were taken out day and night. And we were there for rest and rehabilitation. And the other side of us was a big place that had war dogs with bark all night long. Then in front of us we had the Japanese prisoners of war. They wouldn't work, they went on strike, they wanted more ice cream. We didn't get any. Mm -hmm. So we were told to go out and fix them. Well, I couldn't tell you what happened after that, but so that was for rest and relaxation, yeah. No, R and R. Yes. And how long were you on Guam? And when you left Guam, Guam, what happened? We were on Guam for about a month. Just about a month on Guam. So they we had, they were getting a group ready to go to China. So they picked the Sixth Marine Division. They sent us to China to disarm the Japanese. We took the, took the fields off them and everything over there. We went to a city called Tsingtao. I never heard of it, but it had four million people. In World War I, it was a, a gigantic German naval base. And all, a lot of, lot of, we met a lot of nice people, a lot of people out there. It's a beautiful city. It's, all, it's a really big, big city, beautiful city. But then when we got there, we seen these guys running on the road with ropes on their neck, and the guys were whacking them with clubs. They were Mao Tse Tung, they were the communist Mao Tse Tung's troops being chased by the other guy, Premier. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then when we left in February, it was the other way around. The communists were chasing them down the street with them around their neck. And we, we, we disarmed them. We disarmed the Japanese in the base. We put them on, we turned them over to the Koreans. Mm -hmm. I sh probably shouldn't say this, but the Koreans had a trial and everything all one, one hour of trial and execution and everything else all, all in one hour. Yeah, they hated them. Yeah, they they, they hated the, the Chinese. Mm -hmm. they, they, they hated the Japanese. Mm 
Because mm -hmm. the Japs had, they, they mistreated them something terrible. Hmm. Okay. Okay. But a lot of my experience, though, what, what really gripped me most of all was watching these families jumping into the, off the cliffs into the water, into the rocks. Yeah, I imagine that would really get to you. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing that training did not prepare you for. That's for them thing. That's that's individual. Mm -hmm. What were you thinking at the time when you saw that happening? Were you thinking that this is not something that should be going on? Uh, I, I think, you know, like we, saw, we saw a picture before in Peleliu or different places, different uh, islands. They're doing the same thing all over the place. Huh? They're, they're committing suicide because their propaganda was so terrific. Ours wasn't, our propaganda wasn't, was bad too. Mm -hmm. The stuff they showed us before we ate and stuff, they showed us different pictures and they're like, we were out in the street someplace and I saw a girl, I wouldn't even shake hands with her. <laughs> The United States has the same propaganda as everybody else. Oh, yes, yes, yes. While you were on uh, Okinawa, that's the first time that you saw combat, was it? Well, we did see snipers. We had snipers up on the, on the Guadalcanal. Okay. They were dug in there. But no hand-to-hand -hand combat. Hand-to-hand. -hand. Yeah. That's the difference between the war in Europe and, and uh, out there. Mostly in the South Pacific was hand-to-hand. -hand. Europe was by the millions. Mm -hmm. Big, big things that ours are really down to earth combat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But like I say, you can sit and explain this for hours, but unless you see it, you can't believe it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, like um, you see dead bodies there and burning, and see parts of like we one K we went into it must have been a Japanese hospital or something like a low oh, smell of kill you, legs and arms all over the place, part body parts. Did you maintain contact with your family while you were there? No. You didn't allowed. write no letters or we anything? We had few letters. They wouldn't let you send them. Oh, so you did not receive any mail the whole time you were there? No. Hmm. When was the first time you received a mail from your family? When well, we got on Guam. They gave us all the stuff we wanted on Guam. Hmm. For a little while we were there. So that's where you got all of your mail? Mm -hmm. Uh, while you were on Okinawa, did you have chance to relax at all? Or was it just constant? Uh, Three months, ago, no, no, no chance at all. No chance at all. What, what, what hurts you out there in, uh, in the Pacific too is, it's not only the, it's the climate and everything else, while you have these leeches that get all over your legs, and they won't come out, you have to have a cigarette to burn the head up, if you don't they pull out the head stays and it infects you, mm -hmm. and malaria is rampant out there. Like I told you, the priest, Father Wall, is from New Zealand. He told me that the life expectancy was about 35 years. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, do you have any kind of wild uh, animal stuff out here? Is, uh, our, our intelligence says no, but I seen guys walk around with no arms and no legs. That's what happened. It's crocodiles. Okay. <laughs> our way says wasn't too smart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I enjoyed the, I enjoyed the Australians and New Zealanders. They are tough and they're, they're, they wanted to know when the United States was going to annex Australia. <laughs> Did they fight alongside of you? Mm -hmm. Where, on Okinawa or? All, all over. All, all over the Pacific. Okay. The only bad feature was that in the morning we used to coffee rations and have coffee. Over there we got tea. I don't mm -hmm. even like tea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And lamb. We'd go out with your bucket. they say, what's that? I'd go, bah. Everybody turn around and walk right right back. Go back and get our spam out. And to this day, you don't like lamb. Mm -hmm. Never. After you went to China, what happened from that point? Well, we we were there. In China, like I say, I never heard of. It. It's called Qingdao now. Is how you pronounce it? So it's, it's four million people there. It was a gigantic base. And we were in our room one time, and the guy says, uh, "Is there a, 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 a corporal, Corporal Ernest Wills here?" I said, "Yes, I am." And he says, "One of your buddies out there, a flyer from the USS Boxers out there, our aircraft carriers out there." Okay, my next door neighbor came in to see me. He's a flyer for the on the Boxer. Oh, that was something. Then the funny part after that, we got together, my brother and three guys from our own street, all met on Guam. And I, I had the I had captured a big flag out at one of the bases there, a big Japanese flag, and I was so proud to take that home with me. So 
I take it home and I belong to an athletic club back home, athletic club, and uh, I, I thought I would donate it to them for you know, donation and stuff. So I did, and I come up one Saturday after they went for a beer, and I seen they're painting the club, and you'll you, use the flag for a drop cloth. Well, that steamed me. I can imagine. And I told them how to tell them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you know that these friends of yours were in the service? Yeah, I knew it was, I don't know where. Okay. I didn't know how. I, we always thought, you know, we're going up and say, oh, we're going to Hawaii. <laughs> we didn't <clears throat> got nowhere in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. We bypassed it. But the funny part is we're on a ship with no escort. And all we get, to, we were told what to do, like put your life jacket on if you see any, any periscopes. But I was a bottle of all periscopes. When were you on these ships? Yeah. Well, you were on these ships en route to, route to one of the islands? Different islands, yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we spent a lot of time aboard ship. So you went from island to island mm -hmm. uh, aboard ship? We attacked one island there one time, our intelligence, our OSS, I'm not too proud of. And we got th immediately off the island. We found out it was a leper colony. Mm -hmm. And leprosy, you can't believe what people look like with leprosy. Mm -hmm. That's why I say wars, but that is hell. That's like today, I feel sorry for these kids. Mm -hmm. Don't sound like much, one or two, but they belong to somebody. Oh, yes, yes, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. So when did you return to the United States? After you left China? Yeah, they said well, on the USS Wakefield in China, 19, February 1946. Mm -hmm. We wound up in San Diego again. And the first thing they did, they treated us royally. They gave us all chicken, ice cream, everything, anything we wanted. Every guy's outside throwing up because we weren't used to that kind of food. Because used to that kind of food. Uh -huh. Where were you at the time the, the atomic bomb was dropped? I was on did the you know about it? We knew it was there. And it was, uh, it was on a small island next to it, right near our island, not the smaller island. They didn't put it on Guam because there were too many troops there. They put it on a smaller island away from Guam. Oh, the, the, the plane the that bomb. was going to carry the bomb? Yeah, it wasn't on Guam. Because mm -hmm. we knew it was there. And so, well, we heard conjecture from these sailors that this looked like a basketball. And it's surprising. It's bigger than this table. Mm -hmm. But we figured that at the end of the war. I didn't think we'd use it, but. But if Germany had it, they would have, so would Japan. So were you on Guam when they dropped the bomb mm -hmm. on Japan? And you felt that, well, this is the end of the war? The end of the war. It? We did it right out. We're going right home until they alerted the 6th Marine Division for occupational duty in China. Mm -hmm. in and China. how long were you in China? Six months. Six months? Okay. That's a, it's a beautiful country. China is really nice, and the people over there, they're not, it's like in Russia, it's just a hardcore communist. Other people aren't that way at all. Mm -hmm. They're nice. And over there, too, elderly, you know, special, special attention or special treatment. They're very nice to their parents. Mm -hmm. Not like here, they throw you off a bus. So you felt that the Chinese people were human beings like? Very, very nice. Yeah. We had one incident there. We, they had us in this hotel. as a rather oh, it was a crummy hotel. And uh, we... we Is we, that where you stayed when you, for the six months you were in China? You mm -hmm. stayed in, in a hotel? Oh, I went a hotel. Mm. <laughs> By name only. Then uh, we hired a room boy. And that was funny. It was Christmas time. So we said, Ask your father what he'd like to have for Christmas. The kid was a nice little kid. He's my father smoked cigarettes. So we bought him a carton of Chesterfields. We gave him for Christmas Eve. He brought it back the next day. His father went with Lucky Strikes. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. We didn't even get them. <laughs> when you were in China, did you have any opportunity for relaxation? Did you have yes, we did. any entertainment? How do you entertain yourself? Well, in China, it's funny, and we went in the bar room, and we're sitting there, and we met a guy, a, an old gentleman from England, and he's sitting there playing one of these three-string troika things, and we enjoyed having a beer, and some of our sailors come in, some of the wise guys, 
And the one guy, you come over and hit the, hit the old, he was from England, this man was, and he hit him on the head and I slapped him and he took his thing off and started monkeying around with his, uh, his little play thing. Mm -hmm. So I told him to knock it off, he said, make me. So him and me, I saw too many John Wayne movies. We both walk out these doors, I beat the heck out of him out there. I walked back here you know, like John Wayne. <laughs> but the funny part over there, they had, we on the back bar, they had, uh, Different whiskeys and had a B29 bomber whiskey, 50 years old. Mm. The B29 had just come out. <laughs> and on the steps, instead of go up, it had signed, please tow up. Mm. And I never order a, a seven course meal in China, especially fish. About the sixth thing you take the lid off, and there's a fish looking at you. <laughs> For me, we weren't allowed to eat their food because they used human excrement for time. Did you have a mess hall in the hotel? Yes, we did. And it was staffed by Americans? Mm -hmm. That's why they told us not to eat their food. Mm -hmm. And in the, the rain court, is always a sign, every place you go in the rain court, is a sign, take all you want, but you know you take, because they won't court wash if you waste food. Mm -hmm. So we mowed hands out and we took a lot of extra stuff and they wonder why we're doing it. We walked out, there was about a thousand kids out there holding their hands, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. giving themselves. And Chinese kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, they were trapped then because this one fellow, me, a guy from Philadelphia, me, we're out walking one day and we passed a little bakery, a European bakery. So we went in and they saw the guy and we said, What does all that food cost in the window? He said, About $200,000 yuan. I said, What's that equal to our American money? About Thirty-five cents. We bought the whole wind and gave it to the kids. He says, "Don't ever do that again. You'll spoil. You'll spoil mm -hmm. them." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chan Chan is a nice country. It's beautiful, beautiful scenery. Were you? Did you feel afraid when you were in China? Afraid? Yes. Afraid of the people, or no, afraid? Of as far as we were, because we thought about communists. Like I say, communists is only a small. Portions mm -hmm. of their people. So at first, when you first got there, you were, we're apprehensive. Mm -hmm. But then we had the Russians were there too, and the, they, were, they were kind of kind of bullish. Like if you walk down the street, they try to knock you off the road, and we were told, "No, no, get knocked off the road by a Russian, or else." Mm -hmm. So we whacked them first. But like I say, the whole just this whole thing was depression, toughness. Mm -hmm. Because my father came here and I had his, all the stories he told me about Germany and I thought, gee, boy, what a, what a beautiful country and people don't appreciate it. Well, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You didn't have any opportunity to uh, uh, see any USO shows? Did you oh, know? Oh, you Bob Hope. Mm -hmm. no, oh, they came to? Different, different islands, none and in China. Okay. The Chinese are all put on by the Chinese, but in the South Pacific. Every once in a while, it'll be a different island. They they be a visit you. Where did you uh, see a show? Where were you? Well, was, I think it was on Guam. On Guam. Okay, Guam's while a you big were island. There. Mm -hmm. So while you were there, you had a chance to uh, see some of the USO shows. Mm -hmm. And how did you feel? Were you? Did you appreciate them being there? Very much. Mm -hmm. I, mean, it, it, I mean, a little humor it means a lot. Like. Um, like the one time we go, they had movies every night. Well, we had logs cut down for us to sit on, and it rained on us all the time in the Pacific. And we sat there one night, waiting an hour to see a picture. We couldn't see the picture yet because the general hadn't come in yet with his escort. When the general came in, we'd ever get start booing. No, no more movies for a week. <laughs> Knocked them all off. Mm -hmm. But he later became the commandant of the Marine Corps. What general was this? Lumble Shepherd. Oh, okay. He's from the south or somewhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Most of the Marines are from the south. What? Uh, how would you describe the morale of the Marines? Very during high. This time, very high. They're very. They're very close knit group. Mm -hmm. And they they're very very. Uh, they watch out, watch out each other too. Because you're you're you're. Well, they build you up and they say, how wonderful you are. They tell you how good you are. <laughs> you get to believe it. Mm -hmm. You get to believe it yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, they start that 
back in boot camp. Huh? Yeah. Well, what I was talking about before, that Black Sheep Squadron, I can't think of the guy's name, the head of there, Pappy, Pappy Boynton. Oh, yes. Okay. We met them, they're nuts. They're all goofballs, but the best flyers in the Pacific. And boy, used to, we used to appreciate to see them over us. They had quite a reputation. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was, besides the families jumping off the cliff, what was the most memorable thing? Uh, what do you remember most about uh, your experience during the war? Well, I think the, the thing that would great work me most was going, going, going over the side of the boat on the landing nets, because mm -hmm. if you had 60 pounds and if you drop, you're gone. Mm -hmm. you, they'd never find you nowhere. That's something, well, we didn't know what, what it was all about. But I mean, that experience of watching on people jumping in, and especially little kids come out and shake, they're shaking, and oh, I, I, they have nothing to do with it. So that stays with you. Then uh, when you get home, hell, at that age, you're gung ho. You think, oh boy, mm -hmm. I'm tough as hell. But after you think it over, you think, I just think, it wasn't worth it. Mm -hmm. They're human beings. They're doing what they're told to do, like we're done what to do. And don't let me kid you, the United States is no different than anybody else when it comes to propaganda. Just like today. If you had a chance to talk to young people today about the military, what would you tell them? Well, I mean, it, you should serve your country. I would say the United States Marine Corps is, is the place to go. Mm -hmm. because. It's easier to train thousands than millions. Because the Army held you out there in mass. And the Marine Corps, they think special trains with you. So like on, on a Paris Island, boy, they were strict out there. And uh, we had these pith helmets on. And uh, I was standing at attention and the, the bug was chewing me up. And I put my hand like that and was, the D.I. came over and he slammed me over my wrist like that. So I said, no, you don't ever do that again. I says, I, I, I've, got to, I've got to take a pull. Oh boy, I got court martial. I, I got duty on, the, uh, duty on the range on top of the stove. Stub, uh, for a week I had to scrub a stove. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they, what they say is law. But it pays so, off. So you feel pride being having been the Marine? Mm -hmm. And if you had it to do all over again? Same thing. It'd be a Marine. What would you like to leave for your children? What would you like to say to them about your military service? About military service? Well, I mean, everybody should be, should have some responsibility in you know, the presence of their, of their country. But uh, don't be bombastic. Just go along with the crowd. I mean, it's your, it's your country. You know, I, I really believe that if they take everybody in the United States and ship over to some place like we were and see what's going on, they'd come back here and they'd get down on their knees. So they'll have a different view. You better the believe it. Yeah. They, take, they take too, many, too, too much for granted here. You know, life's not that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After a while you get a remorseful too, you get older. I killed a few people, but I asked God, do you think I did right? I, I didn't know what to think at that age. Well, I was gung ho, but you get older, you get more brains. Mm -hmm. But one thing, though, the Marines, they do take care of each other. Mm -hmm. And one thing, never let anybody injure a dead body. On a, they're all taken right back, one way or another. Mm -hmm. And although you killed uh, some people, you feel that it was justified and you're at peace with yourself? At that time, sure it was. But after seeing all these films and stuff, about, especially the, the, I showed us the, the, the picture of the rape of Dan King, that really got to me. Mm -hmm. They were so terrible. They killed 400,000 people there. Mm -hmm. so they were, don't be kidding you, the, the smaller, they said they're small people. We met their Imperial Marines and they are bigger than these damn na national football players today. They're big guys. But the only thing is a 30 caliber is just as equal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you tell your children, be proud of your country? That's right. Okay. You better believe it. 
Well, uh, Mr. Willsby, thank you very much for sharing your experiences with us. I get very talkative. You know, it does. It, sometimes you hit a, hit a nerve. Well, yes. But see, this is the opportunity for you to do that mm -hmm. and for you to think back on what happened and uh, let your thoughts just come out. Yeah, when you, you feel different when you're 18 and 19 and not when you're 80. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. We certainly appreciate it. All right, so uh, enjoy it. Tell people just what I, what I feel like. Like today, even at night in bed, sometimes in bed, just, just flashes back and think, did I do right? Did I do the right thing? And how do you answer? I said, well, it's either, either him or me. This preservation is a wonderful thing. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you.